For this one, you'll be getting two data sets, one for aluminum and one for steel, and we should have one raw data set also to give to you. So this was, it's not a full set of three because I think it's a little bit more difficult to actually get data for these because you have to manually record it. You can't just put a thing in, the, in an Instron and get a data set out, but there should be two. Uh, so we'll, I think now Bill has a raw data set that he'll, he'll, he's giving to us and we'll put it on Canvas today probably. Um, yeah, so you'll have your lab and then one extra, which is a little bit easier, but the analysis might be a little bit weirder. <laughs> so, uh, I know, fun. I'm sure that's exactly what you all want to hear. Okay, so for torsion now, do, do, do. torsion, we have one of these rod specimens. Damn it. <coughs> Let's see if it goes. There we go. That's better. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Sorry about that. Okay. So for torsion, we have one of these long, slender rod specimens. Uh, they don't necessarily have to be slender. Uh, but you need to make sure that the grip here at the top isn't affecting the state of stress. So when you're when you're clamping on it, you're applying some pressure to it, and that'll change the state of stress in the grip section. What you want to make sure of is that you're you have a sufficient gauge length that you're not changing that state of pure shear in here. Um, and we'll take this thing. If there's initially some straight line, I'm going to apply. This is what I had mentioned yesterday. I'm going to apply some torque T to this specimen uh, here at the bottom. As I twist this, uh, I'm going to be twisting it by some angle here, theta. This now, there's going to be some corresponding gamma along the surface. Um, what else do I need? Right, there's this sample has an initial diameter or initial radius, R are not for the outer radius. Uh, da, da, da. I'm going to call this an x direction, uh, and this is an r direction. So starting from the center of the sample going out is our r. Uh, and the idea again is if I drew a box here on the surface of the specimen, if I, if I drew a square on the surface of that cylinder, before testing it would be a square, and then after torsion, you'd have ideally a state of, uh, after a state of pure shear, where this is then being sheared by some gamma. But now, if you remember, in our circle, So if I'm twisting it by some angle theta here, uh, I have a corresponding gamma as a function of r. This gamma now varies throughout the sample. In the center of the sample, there's zero. So in the in the very core of the sample, there's because of the, the symmetry of it, there's no twist. It, it doesn't, there's no shearing along the neutral axis of this thing. Um, and here at the outer edge of the specimen, you have the most twist. So this gamma then is a, is a linear function of R in the elastic regime. So here we can say now this gamma varies depending on the amount of twist we have. So gamma is proportional to the amount of twists, we know that gamma varies linearly with R, and it'll change depending on uh, one over the length. So if, if that length is longer, I need to twist that much more to get a proportional amount of, of shear in the specimen. 
just because there's more specimen to deform, more specimen to twist. So this gamma ends up as uh, theta r over l. I, the equation that I have for that The question now uh, is how the stress and shear, the torque and shear stress relate, and how the the shear strain and torque relate. Because here, the values that I'm applying, the the two that you're applying in the lab, are this twist and this torque, or you're applying a twist and you're measuring a torque. So you're getting these two values out. But what you want to know is the shear stress in the sample. So here, we know we can say what the shear strain is given the amount of applied twists that we give to it. Um, the shear stress is a little bit more complicated. So the way that we go about finding it, I'm going to draw in lots of circles today, um, is you remember our shear is equal to G gamma. This was our engineering shear strain relationship engineering shear stress shear strain relationship. Here now, I'm on the sample of some torque T on the, on the outer part of the specimen. Internally in the specimen, there's some shear stress that's balancing that out. So that shear stress inside now, um, there's some shear stress that, that accommodates it. And now I need to find, if I know if I know my shear is G gamma, I know this is also equal to G theta R over L. Um, but I want to know, so where this is the amount that I'm applying, this is a, a measurable quantity, and this is a measurable quantity, and it varies linearly with R. So again, shear stress would be zero here in the center and maximum along the outside. But I want to know how this shear stress relates to the torque that I'm applying. And what I can do to figure that out is a to uh, momentum balance. So now I know, let's say, um, <coughs> I don't want to draw this. If I draw, let's say, a, a small unit circle inside here, this is out at some radius r. It has some finite width, finite thickness, dr. I know that my torque from <coughs> physics is force times distance. <coughs> Here now, I know <coughs> the force acting in this little thing. The force is torque times area, where, or my, my shear stress, sorry, force is shear stress times area where I know my shear stress now is this relationship here, G theta R over L, and my area is the area of this infinitesimal ring. Da, da, da. Da, da, da. Da, 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 Drawing in a shaded circle, um, which is 2 pi R dr. So this is the, the equation for the area of a, of a thin, hollow ring. Uh, I know this distance now. My distance is actually just r, because it's added this distance r away. So, but I, and then I know that torque is varying with r. So what I can do is I can say that torque now is an integral from my 0 to r0, because now I want to find I'm, I'm summing up all the torques, the shear stress at every point to balance out the torque. Um, force g theta r over l, area 2 pi r <coughs> dr, and there's an extra r there. Yep. There we go. So this, I can pull some stuff out. It's not pi over L integral of R cubed dr. So this is just reorganizing this equation. And this is from 0 to R naught. So now, integrating this guy, I actually get 
there's this there's a there's a useful quantity in here um, called a j, which is equal to two pi integral of r cubed dr r naught or pi over two r naught to the fourth. This quantity j is known as my second so area moment or moment of inertia you should remember from physics the the amount the, how difficult it is to twist a body this is a, a similar quantity called an area moment of inertia or, or second moment of area second moment of area which is um, kind of a, a geometric resistance to twisting uh, and we'll see this quantity pop up again later when we do beam bending and beam buckling because uh, it's a structural property but uh, so now uh, how do I want to write this out this I can say my torque is equal to g theta j over L uh, yes, yes. So now I want to relate this back to my torque. So I or my uh, I want to relate this torque back to my shear stress. So here you you know torque is g theta l r. So g uh, I can erase the. G theta over L is equal to tau over R. So this is now, I can say, equal to tau J over R. And this is specifically for the elastic regime. This is while that, this is while my shear stress well, my shear stress is varying linearly in my sample. So I can say here, this, this is my relationship for shear stress in the sample in the elastic regime. I can plug it into this relationship for torque, do a torque, uh, do, a, do a moment balance, torque is equal to force times distance, uh, say that torque is changing, or shear stress is changing along the, the inner radius, plug that into an integral, and I get this relationship popped out. So in the elastic regime, you can directly relate the torque to the applied, uh, or the torque to the internal shear stress based on the geometry of the specimen. Did I mix something up? No, that should be good. Okay, so in your lab you'll be applying, or you'll be you'll be applying this twist. You'll be applying this twist theta. You'll be measuring a torque t out on that digital readout, and you'll be directly relating it to the shear stress in the specimen. Now, this is all in the elastic regime. So this is two. two, two. Move stuff around. This is while my my stress is still linear inside of my sample, so while it's still elastic. At some point, we're going to twist it beyond the plastic yield point. So now, let's look at. So initially we're going to start off somewhere here. My shear stress my shear stress is going to be linear as I twist it more. The shear stress will go up until some point happens where 
this begins to plastically deform on the outer edge of the specimen. So inside uh, torque R, my shear stress is always going to be zero in the center. There's going to be some elastic region where this, the shear stress is building up, and then some plastic region where it starts, where, where I exceed the sh plastic yield stress of the material. Da, da, da. So inside here now, I have uh, this is now an elastic regime. This is now a plastic regime. Um, and there's some critical point, Ry, which is uh, the plastic radius. So there's, there's some critical radius where that starts to happen at. Now, we can relate that critical plastic radius. Um, we can figure out that critical plastic radius if we know what the yield strength of the material is. So we know for a material there's some yield strength, tau y, uh, this is the shear yield strength. Um, from that, uh, from some of the relationships we had before, we can say, if you remember, uh, tau is equal to g gamma, which is equal to, uh, oh, g gamma, which is equal to g theta j, g theta r over L. I can say that our yield is some torque yield L over G theta. Um, yeah. Which then directly relates to my torque in some way. Where do I have that? somewhere. Why am I missing that? No. That should be fine. Um, so, so in this specimen you can find when, when the amount of twist here, when your amount of twist theta exceeds uh, and, and your known yield strength of the material, uh, when that starts to, when this plastic radius starts to, is, is less than the, the diameter of your specimen. So when, when this Ry is less than your outer diameter, you know the specimen uh, has begun to yield. Now, this gets a little bit tricky. So I'm going to talk a little bit about plasticity uh, without actually going through a ton of the detail. But uh, I think on Friday, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the plastic yield criteria. But today, just to get through the, the torsion lab and kind of give you all the stuff necessary for it, um, you remember from your uniaxial tension experiment sigma epsilon. If you pull a material, at some point it'll start plastically deforming. Um, that can happen in a couple of ways. This can be hardening. Uh, it can be perfectly 
plastic. It can also be softening, but generally the, a material that softens is unstable. Um, so we're not gonna worry about that. But there's some elastic regime here where you know uh, in this elastic regime, sigma is equal to E epsilon. Here, when it starts to deform plastically, Plastic deformation. There's a whole bunch of different models and theories to describe the shape of that yield surface, to describe how that thing hardens and softens. Um, if it's perfectly plastic, uh, if it's perfectly plastic, then I just have sigma is equal to the yield strength, where this is my yield strength. Um, most of the time, sometimes that's a reasonable approximation. A lot of the time it's not. If you remember for your aluminum and steel tests, there was some hardening going on as you plastically deformed it. Um, so if we have some hardening relationship, Again, there's a, there's a million different ways to do this, but the simplest one is just a power law or, or an exponential hardening relationship. So here I can say my sigma is equal to some h uh, epsilon to the n, where this is now, this h is a constant that gets me to this point. So to make sure that, um, that sigma at at the yield strength is equal to my yield here, um, which is how you calculate this hardening uh, constant out front. And then this n, this n describes kind of how the, the magnitude of this slope here. So if that n is very high, then you may have something that goes up very strongly. If you have an n that's very low, uh, you may have something that's more close to perfectly plastic. And so that N controls where this slope is, exactly how how high this is. So this would be increasing N. So now what we can do is take this relationship, this power law hardening relationship and plug this back into um, our, our torque equation. So, uh, do I want to start a new piece of paper? Probably do. So now, let's redraw some stuff. Do that. Da, da, da. I should make that bigger. Radius R Y R by shear stress. Um, this is now I can say torque is equal to G gamma here now. Um, so I had shown sigma is equal to H epsilon to the N. Um, these are actually quantities that we were debating having you guys pull out of the out of the tension experiments that you had done last week, but we figured there was already enough to do in there, so we didn't want to throw extra stuff at you guys. But um, I'm going to throw this relationship at you, and I'm going to explain it tomorrow. Uh, but if you want to relate this to our shear strength, this is tau root three. Root three is equal to H gamma over root three to the N. Um, and yes, I know that H and N are constants, and I could just 
factor stuff into them, factor these root threes into them, but the idea is that these quantities are pulled from a tensile experiment and they then directly relate, the, these H and N are pulled from a tensile <coughs> experiment and directly relate here to our shear stress. Um, so now, actually these, these two quantities, this H and the N, uh, the TAs will be providing for you for this lab. So you don't have to worry about getting these from your old tensile data. We'll be, be populating that for you. Uh, now, if I want to figure out what the torque is, how, how this torque balances out. So I know my torque is my force times distance, but this is now, there's some elastic component and some plastic component of my shear stress now that I'm trying to balance it out. So if I, if I integrate through this thing, the shear stress in this central part below Ry is elastic, out here is plastic. So I can plug some stuff in. I know in this elastic part, uh, tau is g gamma. In this plastic part, tau is h over root three gamma over root three to the n. This is now the integral, the elastic part zero to ry uh, of the same thing that we had before, which was g theta, g theta two pi over r cubed dr is my elastic part. Here then outside of that ry to r naught, um, there's something a little bit more complicated uh, now this is, oh, a gross one, h over root 3, theta r over root 3, uh, this is replacing gamma equals g theta over l, uh, into there, this to the n, 2 pi r squared, dr, and this is my plastic component. Now, these end up being, for the elastic one, it's, I, it's what we had gotten before, but now I'm going to report it in terms of this ry, because it's not, it's no longer a, a polar moment of inertia, because it's not going through the full circle, um, or it sort of is, but only through half of this thing. Uh, this is tau, Pi over two. Oh, yep. Pi over two. R y to the fourth over l over r. Um, where r y was calculated from the equation for r y we had before, and this r is that is a is a variable. My tau plastic or my torque plastic is a big gross thing, 2 pi h over square root 3 and plus 3 theta over l root 3 to the n, r outer to the n plus 3 minus r y to the n plus 3. So, In your lab, what you'll be doing is, in the elastic regime, um, in the elastic regime, you'll be using this uh, torque shear stress relationship to figure out what the shear stress in the sample is. Um, in the plastic regime, once it starts deforming plastically, once that R Y is less than your outer radius, then you have, you have to figure out where that ry is um, and use these two components to figure out what the stress in the elastic and plastic regions are. So this is where, again, the non-uniformity of the shear stress in this torsion specimen makes this a really weird 
problem and kind of difficult to analyze. Um, the TAs will be there to walk you through this analysis. I am also here to help you out, but this is kind of what you'll be going off. Um, yeah. Cool. So, questions on that? Yeah. Uh, n plus three. Sorry. This R not the N plus three R Y the N plus three. Yeah. And that just comes from that integral here. Because I have an R to the N plus two. Yeah. for the stress in the plastic region, um, you use this torque relationship and you assume that the shear stress follows this hardening here. Yeah, it'll be, yeah. Uh, the, the TAs will be able to walk you through the analysis a little bit better. So, um, next we're going to jump into plasticity. So, I talked about it really briefly here with some of these plasticity relationships, but the question isn't always how it deforms after it started to yield. The question is where it's going to deform. From an engineering standpoint, that's the most important problem. If your material has started to fail plastically, it's already broken. It's, so as an engineer, you never want plastic failure to start. So the initiation of failures is often the more important quantity than actually knowing the exact shape of the plastic uh, behavior after yielding. But to do that, um, we need to roll back to our stress transients and our principal stresses. And before doing that, uh, I wanted to roll back further and make sure you guys had a solid hold on stress transformations and what stress transformations are. So this is this is more for as as a double check to make sure everyone's kind of has a good idea of what's going on when I say stress transformations. So I'm gonna try this out. I think the, the exercise yesterday didn't seem super successful. I think I didn't make it open-ended enough. So I'm going to try going further and making this completely open-ended now. So um, this one won't be an ABC poll. What, uh, what I'm actually going to have you do is think about this problem for a minute or two, maybe write down an answer, uh, and then talk to the people next to you. Uh, about what these what the answers might be so there's a couple open-ended ones why do we do stress transformations and what happens to stress when we transform it the first one is very open-ended the second one has a more definite answer so I want you to think about it for a minute maybe write down an answer And then after a minute or two, I'll have you talk to your partners.
Okay. That's hopefully a good spot. Um, so now that you've had some time to think about it, I want you to turn to the people or persons, persons, people next to you, uh, and talk about these two, and try to come up with an answer between you. Sounds like everyone already came to an answer, um, or just didn't really want to talk to the people next to them very much. Uh, so, would anyone like to share what they had been talking about? Why do we do trans stress transformations, and then what happens to stress when we transform it? That's why I wanted to ask these questions. <laughs> Could you say that again? What the maximum stresses are? Okay, but why? Why would that be interesting? Yes. Okay. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Any other thoughts on that one? This might be restating what, what you just said, but like if, if we know a direction that something is likely to fail, like on the homework, the, the laminations, uh, probably won't fail like with compressive forces, but maybe with tensile forces or shear forces, uh, we could look in that direction specifically to see what this loading looks like in yeah. that direction. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Other, other thoughts? So, uh, you could see... Or, I guess first, did everyone hear uh, Keith, Keith's answer. No, maybe in the back. Do you want to? Sure. Um, so uh, I took the homework question as an example, but with the with the laminations, um, if we know that you know they, they probably won't fail with compressive forces, but with tensile or shear forces, they could if if they were directed along that direction. We could look specifically at that direction to determine with this loading what the stresses in those directions are. Yeah, that's good. Um, other thoughts about why we might do stress transformations?
So yes. So so in general, we do stress transformations because we want to find the maximum stresses in particular directions, and that's interesting because materials fail in certain directions in certain ways. Um, so brittle materials, materials will fail in tension, ductile materials will fail in shear. Um, then does anyone want to give what happens to stress when we transform it? Because this is probably the most important one to get a handle on. Yeah. So, nothing? Did you guys? Uh, it changes magnitude as well as direction. It changes magnitude as well as direction? Well, we are looking at it from a different direction, so it looks like it's a magnitude, but the actual change is nothing. Yes. Exactly. So, this is, this is an important one. When, when we transform the stress, nothing is changing to the stress itself. The stress is some tensor quantity in the body, and we're looking at it in a different orientation. So the magnitude of the stress itself does not change, but so and actually nothing happens to the stress, but we're rotating the coordinate system that we're looking at it in. All right, cool. So tomorrow we'll talk about plasticity stuff.